I'm Diane Whitmore Schonsenbach, the director of the Institute for Policy Research and the Margaret Walker Professor of Human Development and Social Policy. I would like to introduce to you Northwestern's 17th president, Michael Schill, who joined Northwestern in September from the University of Oregon, where he was president for seven years. President Schill is a professor of law in Northwestern's Pritzker School of Law and a professor of finance and real estate in the Kellogg School of Management. He's a nationally recognized expert in property, real estate, and housing law and policy, and is the author and co-author of three books and over 40 scholarly articles. Prior to Northwestern, he also spent time on the faculty at NYU and Penn and was dean and professor of UCLA's law school. He's no stranger to Chicago or, or our winter weather, having served as law school dean and professor at the University of Chicago. President Schill, we are delighted to have you here and we welcome you to your first IPR event, the first of what we hope to be many. Welcome. Thank you, Diane, and it's, it's great to be here today. I, I realize this room is a challenging room because everybody's looking at the lake. Actually, this is probably, I guess, the solution to that is closing, uh, closing the, the blinds. Uh, so I just want to welcome all of you to this afternoon's Institute of Policy Research's um, Distinguished Public Policy Lecture. Now, today's lecture is especially meaningful to me in two respects. The sponsor of this lecture, the Institute for Policy Research, descended from Northwestern Center for Urban Affairs and Policy Research, a center that Becky Blank was affiliated as a fellow for over 10 years when she was a faculty member here at Northwestern. And as all of you probably know, Becky passed away this weekend after a valiant battle with cancer. And as you also probably know, I wouldn't be standing here today if she hadn't fallen ill. Now, Becky was a good friend and colleague to many of us here. She was passionate about ideas passionate about inequality, and I have no doubt followed the work of our guest Raj Chetty very carefully. Which brings me to the second reason why this lecture is so important. Back before, at least important to me, but back before I moved to the dark side and became a law school dean and then twice and then president twice. Uh, my scholarship was focused on issues of neighborhood poverty, particularly the impact of housing on people's life's choices. Now with sophistication and nuance, Raj Chetty has demonstrated in scholarly and public fora the important importance of place in terms of both racial justice and in terms of economic mobility. His work has revolutionized the field and provided an example of how important what we do as scholars, what IPR faculty, postdocs, and graduate students do, how important that is to the future of our nation. Now, although this is a sad time for our Northwestern community, I see this lecture as an affirmation that the research areas that Becky Blank cared so much about when she was a member of our faculty and our community, that they remain core parts of the DNA of our great institution. And now, I'd like to return the podium to Diane, who will properly introduce our guest lecturer. Thank you. Thank you, President Schill, for that warm welcome and tribute to Becky. We're so glad to have you all here for IPR's Distinguished Lecture Series, which is our first in-person lecture since the pandemic started. IPR's Distinguished Policy Lectures are given by prominent individuals who can speak 
to the use of research in policymaking and other issues. In the past, IPR has welcomed a Federal Reserve Bank president, former Treasury secretary, chairs of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, think tank presidents, and many other illustrious speakers since our first distinguished lecture in 1994 with then U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala. Now, I can't think of a speaker that better represents IPR's mission of research excellence with policy impact than pathbreaking economist Raj Chetty to get us back to our in-person lectures and the engaging policy conversations that always follow. And to that end, please save your questions for the Q&A following the lecture. Raj is the William A. Ackman Professor of Public Economics at Harvard University and the Director of Opportunity Insights, a research and policy institute that he co-founded in 2018 that he uses big data to study the science of economic opportunity. Raj received his PhD from Harvard in 2003 and is one of the youngest tenured faculty members uh, in its history. He was previously a tenured faculty member at Stanford and Berkeley. He's received numerous awards for his research, including a prestigious MacArthur Genius Grant in 2012 and in 2013, the John Bates Clark Medal given to an economist under 40 each year whose work is judged to have made the most significant contributions to economic thought and knowledge. As is true of so much of our work here at IPR, Raj's research focuses on careful analysis of data, especially big data, and uses it to answer big questions. His research has contributed to our understanding of tax policy, unemployment insurance, and education, and his research has been widely influential in the academic world and among media and policymakers. Raj is one of the most influential social scientists around today, and as one of his former co-authors, I've seen his extraordinary research creativity firsthand as he examines and re-examines some of our most pressing problems. He uses new methods and massive data sets to answer some of the most fundamental questions in public policy. Today's lecture on creating equality of opportunity in America, new insights from big data, is a perfect example. Please join me in welcoming Raj Chetty to IPR and to Northwestern. Thanks so much, Diane and President Schull, for the very warm welcome. It's really a privilege and an honor to be here with all of you today. So I've not had a direct connection to Northwestern myself, but it's had a big influence on me over the years in a number of respects, starting with my eldest sister, who actually did her PhD here at Northwestern in a very different field in cancer biology. But I remember attending her commencement and being around campus in that context, and I'm the last one in my family to publish a paper and was kind of influenced by seeing here and, and everything that's happened here. And then more directly related to the work that I'm gonna talk about today, as Diane mentioned, uh, she and I co-authored a paper that kind of shaped the trajectory my own area of research took in the past 10 years or so, where I had been doing some work in public economics on issues related to tax policy and unemployment insurance and so forth. And <clears throat> roughly in 2010, uh, we started to get access to some new data, longitudinal tax records, which I'll talk about today. And the first paper we wrote with uh, those data was a study of how your kindergarten teacher affects how much you're earning when you're 30 years old, which was a paper with Diane, and certainly had a very big impact on the way I thought about things and the set of issues I started to focus on from there. So Diane, and as I look around the room, I can see a number of other scholars here whose work has had a great influence on me over the years, so it's, it's really a pleasure to have a chance to, to talk with all of you. So uh, I'm gonna talk today about how we can make changes in our local communities, in our own institutions, including here in Evanston, here at Northwestern, to increase uh, economic opportunity and increase social mobility. But I wanna start at a much bigger picture level by talking about the American dream, which is of course a multifaceted, complex concept that means different things to different people but I want to distill it to a simple statistic that we can measure systematically in the data that I think captures a key cornerstone of the American dream. The idea that we at least aspire to be a country where through hard work, any child has the chance of rising up in the income distribution relative to their parents. So in this first chart here, I want to talk about some work uh, my colleagues and I uh, did a few years ago where we set about to assess the extent to which America actually lives up to that aspiration, both in the present day and historically. 
So what we did is just measure the fraction of children who go on to earn more than their parents did, measuring both kids' and parents' incomes in their mid-30s and adjusting for inflation. Now, doing this calculation actually turns out to be technically somewhat complicated because you don't have the right data historically linking parents and children. But I'm going to skip those details. I'm happy to talk about them for those who are interested in the Q&A and just get to the punchline, which is, as you can see here, for kids born in the middle of the last century, it was a virtual guarantee that you were going to achieve the American dream of moving up. 92% of children born in 1940 went on to earn more than their parents did. But if you look at what has happened over time, you can see that there's been a dramatic fading of the American dream, such that for children born in the middle of the 1980s, who are turning 30 around now when we're measuring their incomes, it's become a coin flip, essentially a 50-50 shot as to whether you're going to do better than your parents. Now, this dramatic trend is, of course, of great interest to economists like myself because it reflects a fundamental change in the U.S. economy that we'd like to understand. But I would argue it's also a fundamental social and political interest because I think it's this very trend that underlies a lot of the frustration that people around the United States are expressing, that this is no longer a country where it's easy to get ahead, and that's reflected in various electoral outcomes that we see in recent years and so forth. So motivated by this trend, what I'd like to discuss in this talk and the focus of our team's research agenda at Harvard at our group Opportunity Insights has been basically trying to understand how we can restore the American dream, try to understand the determinants of economic mobility. Now, we are, of course, by no means the first to think about these questions of inequality and opportunity. There have been decades, if not 100 years, of research in the social sciences, a lot of it done here in Chicago, here at Northwestern, and, and many others, uh, thinking about the determinants of, of inequality and opportunity. What is new in the type of approach we're taking and other scholars are taking in recent years that I hope to illustrate today is the use of large-scale longitudinal administrative data, to use the Silicon Valley buzzword, big data, to make further progress on these long-standing questions. And so in particular, what these data are going to allow you to do, as I'll show you in the next half hour or so, is study the determinants of economic opportunity with unprecedented granularity essentially by disaggregating data into subgroups. So rather than just starting with that national picture that I showed you there, really look at different communities, different racial subgroups, different income groups, et cetera, to get a much finer sense of the science of economic opportunity, if you will. And also use various quasi-experimental and in some cases experimental methods to analyze mechanisms and cause and effect in a way that previously was, was much harder to do. So what I'm going to do is present an overview of a series of papers with uh, a variety of co-authors, John Friedman, Nathan Hendren, Matt Jackson, Larry Katz, Johanna Strobel, Teresa Kugler, and many others who I'll cite along the way for those who are interested in digging into further details uh, on these papers. And the starting point for a lot of what I'm going to talk about is that there's a lot of spatial variation across the United States in that national picture of differences in economic opportunity. So to show you that, let me turn to this map here and describe the first study that I'm going to talk about. Um, and what I'll do is first describe how we construct this map and then tell you what I think we learned from it. So this map depicts the geography of upward mobility uh, within the United States. The way we construct this map is by using data on about 20 million kids, essentially all children born in the United States between 1978 and 1983. We uh, divide the U.S. into 740 different metro and rural areas, map kids back to where they grew up, and in each of those areas, calculate a very simple measure of upward mobility. We ask, what is the average household income at age 35 for kids who grew up in low-income families, that is, families at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution, which corresponds to a household income of roughly $27,000 a year? Now, how do we measure these statistics? We're using information from anonymized tax returns covering the entire U.S. population, which is what gives you the scale and scope to study these kinds of questions. Okay, so we color the map so that blue-green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, and red-orange colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. Now, if you start by looking at the scale in the lower right-hand side of this map, you can see that there's an enormous amount of variation, even in the present day in the United States, in children's chances of rising up out of poverty. 
in some parts of the country, like much of the rural Midwest, take a place like Dubuque, Iowa, for example, kids growing up in families making $27,000 a year, on average, one generation later, are making forty-five or even $50,000 a year. So that's a tremendous amount of upward mobility in a single generation. But by contrast, if you look at other places in the US, a place like Charlotte, North Carolina, for example, or much of the Southeast, kids starting out in families at the exact same income level, one generation later are actually making less than their parents were or as much as their parents were. And that's, I think, also quite remarkable, given the tremendous amount of economic growth that has occurred in the past 30 years, which you would have expected might have lifted these children up in terms of their uh, average levels of income. So this map, and you can you know, see the broad variation for yourself, you know, higher mobility in the center of the country, parts of the coast, much lower levels of mobility in the southeast, certain cities in the industrial Midwest, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago, which I'll show more detailed data on in a second. Um, you know, I think this map is of interest for two reasons. First, from a policy perspective, if we have, having this picture can help us target policies. So in particular, focusing on the places that are currently in the red and orange colors might make sense if you're trying to increase economic mobility overall. But second, and I think maybe more importantly from a scientific perspective to figure out what policies one should implement to increase economic mobility, this kind of data in a sense gives us a microscope that we never had before to look at these issues at a level of granularity that wasn't previously feasible. So basically by comparing what's happening in a place like Salt Lake City versus a place like Atlanta, or looking at people who move across different areas, we can start to unpack what the drivers are of these differences in economic opportunity with an eye towards potentially making changes going forward that might give children better chances of rising up. So motivated by that logic, what I'm gonna do in this talk is lay out a series of potential explanations. You might already have some in your mind for what is driving the variation that you're seeing in this map and just systematically test what is it that seems to be driving these differences in economic mobility. And then the latter part of the talk, I'll try to take those lessons and show how we might be able to make changes in policy going forward in light of that evidence to increase economic mobility. So the first explanation that many people often think of, especially economists, is maybe this is about differences in, the in labor markets across areas, the types of jobs that are available in one place versus another. So for example, Silicon Valley, we all know the tech sector has been booming in the last 20, 30 years. Maybe that's why parts of the West Coast look pretty good in terms of rates of economic mobility. So to assess that, let me turn to this scatter plot here, which takes the data from the map on rates of upward mobility, here shown for the 30 largest metro areas, and plots them against job growth rates from 1990 to 2010, a simple measure of how rapidly the local economy is growing. You can use many different measures there, the number of high paying jobs, average wages, all of which will point to a similar picture. So when you look at these, the relationship between these two variables, you can basically see that this looks like a cloud. There is basically no relationship. And in particular, you have cities like Charlotte and Atlanta in the lower right here, which are some of the highest growth cities in America. So if you look at any repeated cross section of data, snapshots of data, and look at things like the number of jobs, high paying jobs, average incomes, and so forth, Charlotte and Atlanta would top the list in terms of being rapidly growing cities. Uh, they're viewed as kind of the engine of jobs in the Southeast. But as you can see in the longitudinal data where we're looking at the low income kids who grow up in those cities, Charlotte actually ranks 50th among the 50 largest American cities in terms of rates of upward mobility for kids who grow up there. So first you might ask just arithmetically, how does that add up? How can Charlotte simultaneously be a city with incomes going up on average, but the kids gro growing up there not doing well? So the way I think about it is that Charlotte and Atlanta basically import talent. So my sister who I mentioned before actually is a professor at Emory uh, now at, in, in Atlanta, but she did not grow up uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and so similarly, you know, there are lots of people moving to those cities to get uh, high paying, high skilled jobs, but apparently as we see in the longitudinal data, they're not growing up there. So that simple point, that there isn't necessarily a tight link between rates of job growth and rates of economic mobility, I think in and of itself is useful to note. It suggests in you know, very simple terms that simply trying to get the Amazon headquarters to come to your city, for example, is not necessarily the solution to increase rates of upward mobility uh, in your own city. I think one has to think in a more deliberate way about how one equips people with the skills needed to get those high paying jobs 
even if they exist in a given place. I think human capital development basically looks like it's central in, in light of results like this. Okay, so that's it was the first hypothesis. Maybe this is about differences in jobs. That doesn't seem to be the answer. So let's come back to the map and consider a second hypothesis, this time coming from demography rather than economics. Anyone familiar with the racial demographics of the United States would recognize that there's a potential connection to race here. In particular, the places with larger African-American populations, like the Southeast, like cities in the industrial Midwest, tend to be the places in the red and orange colors here. Now, we all know that there's a long history of racial disparities in America, and so you might wonder how much of the difference that we're seeing in this map across places is actually the result of differences across races in terms of levels of upward mobility. So to assess that, what we did next is took the population tax records, which we used to construct this map here, and linked it to census data, which gives us information on race and ethnicity for everybody in the United States. And that allows us to draw this pair of maps here, showing rates of upward mobility now separately for black men on the left and white men on the right. Exact same statistics that I was showing you before, kids starting out in low-income families, where do they end up in the income distribution? Now, when you first look at these maps, you know, sometimes people have the reaction, oh, they've put these maps on two different color scales, kind of a blue-green color scale on the right and a red-orange color scale on the left. But if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see that, in fact, we have not done that. The maps are on the same color scale. It is just that there's such an extreme difference in rates of economic mobility between black and white men that it's almost like you're living in two different countries, right? So to put it a little bit more precisely, you basically have two almost non-overlapping distributions here. The very best places for economic mobility, for upward mobility for white men, a place like, sorry, for black men, a place like Boston, for example, where a black man growing up in a low-income family can grow up to expect to have earnings of about $25,000 a year, they have lower levels of mobility there than the very worst places for upward mobility for white men, a place like Charlotte, North Carolina. So the simple point these maps make is something I think that would resonate with, with many of us, but is worth, I think, repeating, is that there's no understating the importance of race in America in the present day, importantly, even conditional on class. So remember that we're using very precise information from income tax returns over many, many years to control for people's starting positions, if you will, in terms of parental income. And we're finding that if you take a black boy and a white boy who start out in families at the exact same levels of income, same resources, they have dramatically different prospects of rising up. So undoubtedly, race is incre incredibly important. Now you'll notice here that I <clears throat> subset the data by gender, focusing specifically on men in this case. Why did I do that? If you now replicate the exact same pair of maps for women, comparing rates of economic mobility for black women on the left with white women on the right, now you see a very different picture where the spectrum of colors in the map on the left and the map on the right is basically the same. And more broadly, when we look at many different measures of outcomes, educational outcomes, uh, levels of mobility for kids starting out in higher income families, outcomes for white and black women controlling for parent income basically look the same as each other, whereas for white and black men, you see enormous differences. And so that's useful to note as we think about the source of racial disparities. Apparently, it's something that you know, intersects with gender, and so you might think about things related to the criminal justice system, discrimination in the labor market that's affecting black men in particular. I don't know if we know the answer fully yet, but it's clear that that's important in understanding how to narrow racial disparities going forward. So I've shown you that race seems to be an important piece of what's going on, but even conditional on race, if you look, for instance, in the map on the right, there's an enormous difference in outcomes across places, even among white women. So race seems to matter, but there continues to be an important role for place. <clears throat> so to dig into that further, what I want to do next is look at the data at a finer level of geography. And in order to do that, I'm going to toggle over to this website called the Opportunity Atlas, which you yourself can freely access. If you'd like, go to opportunityatlas.org. And we're going to start with this view, which is the national map of mobility statistics that I was just showing you a second ago. And the, <clears throat> the way this tool works is you can enter in any address, very much like a Google map. Given where we are, I'm going to put in Evanston and literally zoom in to look at the data now, um, census tract by census tract here in this area. And so 
the first thing I want to emphasize is that we have not changed the color scale when I zoomed in in this map, right? So you can see right in the area uh, where, where, where we are at the moment, you can go from the darkest red colors, if you look just south of the river here in, in Evanston, uh, to you know, some of the deepest blue colors in terms of rates of economic mobility. So you know, you're dr driving down a few city blocks and you can go, if you look at the tax records, the kids growing up right here in South Evanston have average incomes in adulthood of something like $25,000 a year. But then if you come down here to places like Rogers Park, uh, you know, a little bit further south, you have outcomes like 50000 or $47,000 a year on average. So, you know, what is that telling you when you think about these differences in economic mobility across places? Um, it's, you can drive, you know, a mile or two down the road, and it's like you're going from Alabama to Iowa in terms of rates of economic mobility. So the simple lesson from that is that the roots of these differences in economic opportunity, they're not coming solely from differences in state level policies or differences across cities in terms of opportunities. Apparently, it's about very sharp differences in outcomes, often for people living on different sides of the same street. It's a hyper-local source of variation that's generating these differences in economic opportunity. So naturally, you know, the question of interest, and you're all much familiar, more familiar with the local area than I am, so you may have some sense of what's going on here, but, you know, more broadly, the question is, what is it that's leading to the dark red colors in some of these places versus the, you know, the deep blue colors in other nearby places? What's driving those very sharp differences in, in economic mobility? So to come back to that, let me come back to the slides um, and turn next to thinking about the mechanisms driving these differences in mobility across areas by looking at families that move across different neighborhoods. And in particular, what this is gonna allow us to do from a social science perspective is address the age old question of whether the differences we see in outcomes across areas are due to selection or sorting, different types of families living in different places, or are they due to the causal effects of place? And if they are due to the causal effects of place, what exactly is the underlying model that's leading to those differences across areas. So I'm gonna give you a sense of how we get at that from a study where we looked at five million families that move across neighborhoods um, using, the, using the tax records. And what I'm gonna do here uh, for, uh, for this broader audience is just summarize what we find in the context of a simple example here in the Evanston area. But then I'm, uh, I'll say a little bit more about the underlying statistical methodology. And again, I'm happy to take questions on that for, from folks who are interested. So to think about this in the context of a specific example, imagine you've got a set of families who move from the south side of Evanston, where as you saw in the Opportunity Atlas data I was showing you before, kids who were born in the early 1980s in South Evanston, grew up in the 80s and 90s, if we follow them in the tax data, they have average incomes in adulthood of around $25,000 a year. And imagine you take a set of families who move from Evanston to Rogers Park where uh, we saw in the data that kids who grew up there from birth have substantially better outcomes on average, okay? So what I want you to do is think about a set of families who move with kids of different ages, starting with families who move when their child is exactly two years old. So what we see in the data, in the context of this example, is if you move at age two from South Evanston to Rogers Park, and we track you forward 30 years in the tax data, on average, your earnings in adulthood are about $34,000 a year. So that's for the kids who make that move when they're exactly two. Now let's repeat that analysis, thinking about kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on, and make that exact same move. What you see is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move, in this example, from Evanston to Rogers Park, or more generally, from a red-colored part of the map to a blue-green-colored part of the map, the less of a gain you get. And if you move after you're in your early 20s, the relationship be becomes completely flat and there's no gain at all. So what do you see from this chart? I think there are three key lessons. First, it appears that where you grow up really seems to matter for your life outcomes. That is, places seems to have a significant causal effect on children's long-term outcomes. Now, just to go into a bit more detail there, what is the key identification assumption on which that conclusion is, is predicated? It is that families who move when their kids are older versus younger have to be comparable to each other. So it can't be the case that the families who decide to make this move when they're three are more educated, more affluent, et cetera, 
compared to the families who decide to make the same move when they're older because that would confound this analysis, obviously, right? So a couple ways to think about how one might address that and what the paper is about is really trying to understand the validity of that assumption and show, show that it seems to hold. So the first thing you can do, and this really takes advantage of the enormous samples here, is you can compare siblings within the same family. So imagine a family that now moves with two kids in this way, from a lower mobility area to a higher mobility area, say with a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. We can compare those kids' outcomes, and remarkably, if you put in family fixed effects and replicate this plot, you get almost an identical picture back. So that shows you that it can't be about fixed differences in families who are moving earlier versus later. It basically takes that off the table. Another type of confound you might be worried about is when the family's moving to a better neighborhood, there's something else changing in the family. Perhaps they're getting a better job, there's a more stable family situation, et cetera, and it's that other thing that's affecting kids' outcomes rather than the neighborhood itself. That would also be, it's a time-varying confound as opposed to one that's fixed across families. To give you a, f a flavor for how we can address that, so <clears throat> one of the things you see in the data, and I'll show you a bit more of this in a second, is that there's a lot of heterogeneity across places in terms of which place is particularly good for certain kinds of kids. So for example, there are some places that are particularly good for boys and other places that are particularly good for girls. So it turns out now, imagine that you have a family that moves with both a son and a daughter to a neighborhood that's particularly good for boys. You see that their son's outcome improves in proportion to the number of years he is growing up there, but the daughter's outcome does not change at all. And so you can do a number of analyses like that where if you think about ex ante, any omitted variable story confound that you might have had in mind, it probably would not have varied by gender in a way that exactly aligns with the duration of exposure within families to the types of places you move, et cetera, et cetera. So I won't go into further detail there, but based on those kinds of tests, our strong sense is that neighborhoods really have a profound causal effect in terms of uh, potentially changing uh, kids' life outcomes. And just at the, at the simplest level, I view that as a very encouraging result because it suggests that, you know, to think about how you might restore the American dream, so to speak, you don't need to look back to the 1950s or to another country. You can look a few miles down the road right here in Chicago, and there are perfectly good examples of places where the American dream is well and alive. And the problem basically becomes trying to figure out what's going on in a place like Rogers Park that's generating those higher levels of upward mobility. So now... What you learn from this chart, beyond just the simple fact that neighborhoods you know, seem to have a causal effect, is that what really seems to matter uh, is, that, is where you're growing up rather than where you live in adulthood. That's a pattern we find here and in a number of other studies. What's really crucial is childhood environment rather than where you're living as an adult. And moreover, the third point that you see is that there seems to be sort of a dosage effect. Every extra year that you spend in that better environment is related to better long-term outcomes. Now, I think that, again, is an important lesson in the context of current policy debates, for instance, on early childhood education. So our sense is that early childhood intervention can be incredibly valuable, but what you see from these data is that moving to a better area when you're 10 instead of 15 or 15 instead of 20 continues to have significant returns. It's not like there's just a critical age at the very earliest years and then nothing matters after that. So our sense is that environment matters throughout childhood not just at the very earliest years, and is worth you know, thinking about how do you improve environment throughout, throughout childhood. And so to that end, um, before I talk about you know, exactly what's driving those differences across areas, which I think is the, is the next natural question, you just make one, one other point, which is I showed you that data in the context of one particular analysis in the US. It turns out you know, since we did that work a few years ago, that analysis basically looking for childhood exposure effects has since been replicated in many, many other contexts using different research designs, different data, and so forth. So experimental variation in the context of the moving to opportunity experiment, a very nice paper in the AER by Eric Chin using public housing demolitions as a quasi-experiment, other analyses in other countries. And I think there's a pretty uniform set of findings now that you find this clear pattern of dosage effects through which neighborhoods seem to affect kids' long-term outcomes. So from this body of evidence, I think the natural next question to ask is, what is it that's happening that's different in some of these environments where we're seeing kids thriving, apparently due to causal effects, uh, relative to places where we see poorer outcomes? So we and many other scholars now have used the type of data that I've been showing you here to analyze what the determinants are of these differences in economic mobility 
uh, across places? And that's a difficult question to, to understand, but let me just start by showing you, uh, you know, summarizing some of the strongest correlations that people have found for these differences in economic mobility across places. In the interest of time, I'll just list the four strongest patterns that people have identified to date. The first is that places with lower poverty rates tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So more mixed income communities tend to be places where kids from low income families tend to rise up. Second, you see that places with more stable family structures, so more two-parent families, uh, tend to have higher levels of economic mobility. Third, and consistent with the work of a number of peop people you know, right here in the audience, places with better schools, both at the K through 12 level and access to higher education, tend to be places with higher levels of upward mobility, as you might expect intuitively. And then finally, places with greater social capital tend to be places with upward mobility. Now this idea of social capital is something that's been discussed in the social sciences for more than 100 years in many, many different contexts. People have had the sense that the strength of the community you're in, the types of networks and ties you have might have a big impact on, on various outcomes. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on that because I think that is indeed one of the most important determinants of these differences in mobility across areas and it so happens to be the most recent work our team has done in a pair of papers well, we published in Nature a few months ago. And so let me go into a little bit more detail on how using the tools of big data, we can now measure social capital with much more precision and start to understand the types of social capital that might matter for mobility and, and why they do so. So in order to do that, I'm gonna to turn to a different data source. We set up a collaboration with Meta, the company that operates the Facebook platform, in order to measure social connections at a scale that you know, really was not feasible in the past. And so in particular, to construct this map, again, let me describe how this is constructed and what, what I think the lessons are. So here we're using completely different data source, data from Facebook on everyone on the Facebook platform between ages 25 and 44. Turns out in that particular age range, you cover roughly 85% of the US population in terms of Facebook users. So it's not exactly like population tax data, but it's pretty close. You have about 70 million people who between them have 21 billion friendships on, on Facebook. So what we do is set up a machine learning model where we can uh, predict pretty well people's incomes on Facebook. So we can identify who's low income and who's high income. And I'm gonna focus on one particular measure of social capital here, the degree of cross-class interaction. So in particular, if you are a below median income person, what fraction of your friends are above the national median of the income distribution? Blue colors here are places where low-income people have more high-income friends, more cross-class interaction. Red colors are places with more disconnection across class lines. So when you look at this map, it probably strikes you immediately that this map looks incredibly similar in terms of the spatial patterns to the maps of economic mobility from the tax data con constructed from a completely different source. And indeed, if you now do a scatter plot of rates of upward mobility from the tax data on the y-axis, against this measure of economic connection, social interaction in the Facebook data, unlike the job growth plot that I started out with, there is in fact a very tight link between these two variables. It's one of the strongest correlations that we or others have, have identified to date. Now you might wonder how much of the link that we're seeing between these two variables is actually the result of economic connectedness itself versus other factors that might be related to economic connectedness. So one simple point is that places that are more affluent, a city like San Francisco, for example, if you're a low-income person in San Francisco, you tend to have more high-income friends because you tend to be friends with the people who are around you. And so you might wonder how much of the higher rate of economic mobility in San Francisco is because you actually have those connections versus the fact that San Francisco, you know, just may have better funded schools, more resources in general, other things that might be directly related to economic mobility. So to get at that, I'm gonna use this chart here, which will be a way to piece apart those uh, two explanations that I just laid out. So to start, and I'll walk through this in steps, let's plot that measure of economic connectedness from the Facebook data against the median household income. Here, each dot represents a different zip code in America. So we're doing this at the zip code level. And so if you look at all these dots, you see a very clear upward sloping relationship, which is exactly the intuition that I just described. If you live in a richer place, you tend to have more uh, rich friends on average. Okay, so now we get to what I really see as the central point here. Suppose you now color these dots by the rates of upward mobility 
from the Opportunity Atlas tax data that I was showing you earlier. Remember, red colors are places where kids are less likely to rise up. Blue colors are places where kids are more likely to rise up. What you see, I think, is a very striking pattern here, which is that if you take any vertical slice of this plot, so say you take the set of zip codes where median incomes are around $50,000 a year, and you move vertically from a place where the low-income folks living there are not interacting with the high-income folks to places where there is a lot of cross-class interaction, you can see the color of the dots is changing systematically from red to blue as you go up in any one of these vertical slices. In contrast, if you take any horizontal slice of this figure, so that is a set of places with very different levels of income, so potentially very different levels of resources and so forth, but the same level of social interaction across class lines, then the colors basically don't change as you go from left to right. So you know this is basically a non-parametric depiction of a two-variable reg regression, and it's basically showing you that if you run a horse race between levels of income and this economic connectedness measure from the Facebook data, it's very clear that the economic connectedness measure is the thing that seems to matter. More broadly, a number of the patterns that people have identified in prior work, links between racial segregation and mobility, links between inequality and mobility, we show in this paper are largely explained by this economic connectedness cross-class interaction variable. Now, you know, why does that variable matter? You know, I think you can think about many mechanisms. I don't think we've quite nailed that down yet. It could be about networks that give you access to jobs that you otherwise wouldn't have had access to. I think maybe even more importantly, it could be about changes in aspirations or social norms. If you've never met anyone who's gone to college, maybe you don't think about that at all. If you're in this more connected community where you see different career pathways and so forth, you yourself might, might pursue, pursue a different path. So, you know, naturally a, a question that comes out of this kind of analysis is you might wonder, well, if we think this economic connectedness uh, seems to matter, um, you know, what is it that's leading to differences in the level of interaction across class lines, even among places that have relatively similar uh, levels of income? And what does that potentially mean going forward for how we might increase uh, economic connectedness? So, to, to get at that, I want to show one final set of results here before wrapping up by talking about some policy implications. So in a, the second paper that we put out studying the, the, the Facebook data, we wondered about what the determinants are of these differences in, e, in economic connectedness. And here, first just want to start with a conceptual point, a division between two different factors that might contribute to economic connectedness that's useful in terms of understanding how we might make progress. So one potential reason we might have a lot of disconnection across class lines in America is a lack of exposure or just segregation by income. So think about a, an example with two schools. Suppose all the high income kids go to school A and all the low income kids go to school B. Since you can't be friends with people you don't meet, that's gonna lead to a very disconnected society by class lines. So that's one possibility and we of course spend a lot of time thinking about how to address these kinds of issues of, of segregation. But there's a different possibility, which is what we're calling friending bias in this paper, which is a lack of interaction, even conditional on exposure. So we might have schools that are actually well integrated, as in this example on the right, yet you don't have interaction across class lines where all the low-income kids are hanging out with each other and all the high-income kids are, are hanging out with each other. Now, understanding which of these two phenomena is driving the lack of economic connectedness in the US, I think is both of academic interest but also of central policy interest because if it's about a lack of exposure then you want to think about things like changes in school district boundaries possibly busing zoning laws things like that if it's about friending bias that may not really be the key thing you've got to think about what is generating a lack of interaction within a given school and how one might be able to address that so with the facebook data we are able to not only measure friendships, but map friendships back to where they were formed. So if you and I went to the same high school, we can make a pretty good guess that we probably became friends in high school. And using that approach, we're able to construct these measures of exposure, shown here on the horizontal axis, and friending bias, shown here on the y-axis, for every school, every college, every zip code in America, which we've now released publicly. And so just to give you a couple examples, let me point out the Evanston Public High School, which is a pretty diverse school. It's got a fair mix of low and high income students. 
It also, as you can see here, is one of the schools that exhibits the highest levels of friending bias in the US. So it's a school where, if you look you know, underneath the surface, there's a tremendous amount of division across class lines, and I'm, I suspect racial lines as well, uh, in that school. In contrast, you, know, you can take another school, Peyton, which is also here in uh, Chicago, is also like a fairly diverse school, and is a school where you actually have much less friending bias, much more interaction across class lines. So I think there's a lot to be understood here in terms of why we're seeing these big differences across these schools on both of these dimensions. The key point I want to make is that what you need to do in a place like Evanston Township High School is very different from what you need to do in a place like West Charlotte High School where the problem is fundamentally about a lack of exposure and you want to think about segregation related issues. Whereas here, I think one wants to think more about friending bias. So one final point on this, we're used to thinking about exposure as being in the domain of public policy. We can think about ways we might change the mix of people at a given school or in a given college. Um, I want to emphasize that friending bias also should be thought of in that way. It's not like some inherent preference people have to be friends with other sorts of people. And I'll just give you one example of that. So here's a systematic pattern that we find in the data. Smaller groups tend to exhibit much less friending bias than larger groups, which I think is very intuitive. If you think about going to a dinner party with 500 people, you'll probably gravitate towards the people you know, the people like you. If you're at a party with 10 people, you'll probably talk to everyone by the end of the evening. So that plays out in a super systematic way in the data more generally. And you can see here, you know, small schools tend to exhibit much less friending bias than large schools that may have implications for things like how we want to set up the size of cohorts or create, you know, a sense of identity in large schools like Evanston, you know, in smaller subgroups, et cetera. And so in that vein, um, if I can take a few more minutes here to, to wrap up, I want to end by spending a little bit of time talking about how the body of academic research that I've been sharing here can actually have some concrete impact on the world going forward. And I want to do that by talking about three different domains for policy intervention that I think flow naturally from the set of findings that I've shared so far. So to summarize in a nutshell what I've shared in, in the past half hour, the way I would capture it is this. The roots of economic opportunity in America are hyper-local. It's about where you're growing up within something like a half mile or one mile radius of your house between birth and something like age 23. Okay, so if you have that model of the world in mind in terms of what's driving mobility, I think you would naturally think about three different ways to increase upward mobility. One is to reduce segregation. So if you see that opportunities look much better two miles down the road, well, why not help more low-income families move to those places? So that's one, I think, practical approach. Obviously, one wonders about general equilibrium implications, whether all families want to make such moves, the scalability of such policies. And so that naturally leads to a, a different approach, a place-based investment approach to try to bring opportunity to people where they are, turn the red colors of the map into blue, green colors as opposed to moving folks. Third, recognizing that the key touch point for most kids after age 18 is not the neighborhood in which they're growing up, but rather where they're going to college. I think there's also an important role for institutions for, of higher education to play in terms of increasing economic mobility, and I'll uh, touch briefly upon that as well. So let me go through, spend a couple minutes on each of these just to give you a flavor of the type of work that, that people are doing in the space and how I think it can have a genuine impact on policy going forward. So let me start with the moving to opportunity or reducing segregation approach and show you another snapshot from the Opportunity Atlas data, this time of Seattle, where you see that familiar checkered pattern with some places with much higher levels of upward mobility than others. What we've done here is overlaid in the bright green dots the most common places where families currently receiving housing vouchers from the federal government currently live. As a bit of context, you might know that in the US we spend about $45 billion per year on various affordable housing programs, the largest component of which are housing vouchers, which in the Seattle area give families about $1,500 a month of rental assistance. Now you might notice a puzzling pattern in this map, which is despite the fact that these families are getting that assistance from the government, those green dots are concentrated in the red and orange colored parts of the Seattle, of Seattle, not the blue-green colored parts. So even though we're spending billions of dollars on this program with one intended goal of helping families, you know, move to better neighborhoods, perhaps rise out of poverty, it doesn't seem like we're really succeeding in, in achieving that goal. And so when we put out this data publicly, a bunch of housing authorities and HUD approached us after having noticed this pattern. They said, you know, can we try to figure out why this is? 
Is it that families have a strong preference to stay in these kinds of neighborhoods for other reasons? Or is it that there's something's pre preventing them from moving to, to higher opportunity places? And so we set up a, a pilot, a randomized trial in Seattle, we call Creating Moves to Opportunity, that basically tried to assess whether removing the barriers that families face in moving to higher opportunity places might change where they chose to live. So think of this as relatively low cost intervention that provides some social support uh, in the housing search process, connecting you to a counselor or a housing navigator who helps you find a unit in a different neighborhood, connects you with landlords who might be interested, provides a little bit of short-term financial assistance like pay an application fee if you need that, et cetera. So we ran it as an RCT, 1,000 families came in to apply for a voucher, 500 of them got this additional assistance, 500 of them did not, here's the result. So in the control group, 14% of families moved to places that we designated as high upward mobility based on the Opportunity Atlas data, consistent with the map that I showed you before with the green dots. In the treatment group, that number jumps up to 55%. More than half of the families are now moving to high upward mobility places. Based on the type of analysis I showed you before, we estimate that the kids who kind of got lucky and ended up in the treatment group, on average, are gonna end up earning about $200,000 more over their lifetimes than the kids who are in the control group. So this small intervention really has a meaningful impact on where uh, families end up moving and their kids' downstream prospects for, for upward mobility. Digging deeper, you can ask, you know, what is the mechanism through which this bundled intervention seems to work? And, you know, we run a subsequent trial where we break the treatment up into multiple arms, and what really emerges is that it's not about things like providing information about high opportunity areas or providing a little bit of financial assistance, things like that. It's really about this customized kind of social support, very consistent with the idea that social capital really seems to matter helping families better take advantage of the resources they're already being offered by the federal government, I think has an enor enormous impact on the efficacy of the program. And so uh, just to show you, and especially for the students here, you know how I think this type of work and the work being done here at IPR more broadly can, can have an impact. Since th that study was done in Seattle, there was a bill passed with bipartisan support in Congress that authorized about $80 million to replicate the thing that was done in Seattle in nine other cities across the United States, and that's currently happening at present. But you know, maybe more importantly, uh, there's another bill that's currently working its way through Congress to um, expand the Housing Choice Voucher Program by about $5 billion per year. And you can see, if you look at the language of this bill, you know, it very closely follows the type of evidence that I've been showing you here targeting kids under the age of six, young kids, giving access to counseling and case management services, engaging new landlords in the voucher program, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just an illustration of how I think academic research, even in this polarized climate, can have a really direct impact on policy and ultimately on people's lives. So last couple of minutes, let me much more briefly touch upon these other two domains. I don't want to leave the impression that I think just moving to opportunity is the solution to solving this problem. I think it can be one part of the puzzle so another approach is to make place-based uh, investments and try to improve opportunity in a, in a given place. And so let me just jump to the key example I want to talk about. So I mentioned earlier that Charlotte is one of the lowest upward mobility cities in America. And so when we put out that data, people in Charlotte became very concerned and they wondered, you know, this is like a wake-up call for Charlotte. What can we do uh, in this context to increase upward mobility in Charlotte? And one of the things that came out of that, they set up a task force and a commission to try to address the problem and so forth. One of the things that happened was that Bank of America, which is headquartered in Charlotte, set up a um, program to hire a thousand people who grew up in disadvantaged communities from Charlotte itself, recognizing that they weren't really helping Charlotte itself despite creating uh, many high paying jobs. And so they teamed up with a group called Year Up which is a sectoral job training program, a nonprofit, as well as a local community college to try to equip people in Charlotte with the skills needed to get these particular jobs. And in prior RCTs that we're now evaluating in collaboration with Europe, we see that participating in these kinds of job training programs can dramatically change people's earnings trajectories in ways that are sustained over time. And when you target these uh, policies at particular places like these disadvantaged communities in Charlotte, you know, I think there's potential to really transform certain places. One of obviously many different potential place-based policies that one might be interested in. And then finally, I want to just briefly touch upon, given 
the context that we're in here, uh, the potential role of higher education. So similar to how uh, we've put out data on every neighborhood in America in terms of rates of upward mobility, we've also put out publicly available statistics on every college's contribution to economic mobility in America. Now, when you think about colleges, I think there are two dimensions to think about how a college is contributing to economic mobility. The y-axis here is what we're calling the upward mobility rate. Among kids growing up in low-income families, say the bottom fifth of the income distribution, what fraction reached the top fifth of the income distribution 10 years after attending a college? So on those measures, you can see that the types of institutions uh, were here, so take Northwestern, for example, or Harvard, or Stanford, Princeton, et cetera. Those colleges look terrific on that dimension. The low-income kids who attend these colleges uh, have excellent outcomes, are very likely to reach the upper middle class or beyond after college. So, so that's very good. But of course, what matters for a college's contribution to economic mobility is not just the outcomes of the low-income kids who are there, but also how many low-income kids there are on campus to begin with. And so that's what's shown on the horizontal axis, what fraction of kids are coming from the bottom 20%. And on that dimension, you know, if you take a place like Harvard and Northwestern, similar, less than 3% of kids are coming from the bottom 20%. At Harvard, for example, you're about 80 or 100 times more likely to attend Harvard if you're from the top 1% of the income distribution than the bottom 20%, despite the vast expansion of financial aid and outreach and the many efforts that folks are making to, to try to address this problem. And so I think a key challenge for colleges going forward is we basically don't have a lot of dots in the upper right side of this figure, right? The colleges that have terrific outcomes don't have a lot of access for kids from low-income families. And the colleges that are currently serving many low-income kids, community colleges typically, often don't have terrific outcomes. And so I think there's a lot to be done on both of those dimensions. I'll end with this chart here just to show that it's not, you might think from that previous chart that it's all about pre-college issues that are difficult to address at the point of college admission or application. But just to give you a sense, this brings us to our team's most recent work and a paper we'll be putting out in a few months using admissions data, linked to tax record data, and so forth. And one thing that you see there is that even if you take kids with similar pre-college qualifications as captured coarsely, say, by SAT scores, take kids, all of whom have an SAT score of, say, 1,500, you are much more likely to attend a place like Harvard, a place like Northwestern, if you're from a very high-income family, even if you have the exact same SAT score as a kid from a lower or middle income family. So there's, that suggests that there's something that can be done within the higher education system itself to increase economic opportunity. And so in a sense, that brings me back to where I started about how Northwestern created some opportunities in my own family. And I hope very much that going forward, we'll be able to distribute those opportunities more widely here at Northwestern, Chicago more broadly, and beyond. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we will open it to questions, uh, which I imagine there are many. Uh, so we have runners going around uh, with microphones, uh, and I will open it up. Uh, give you all a second to. People are shy. Oh, there we go. Oh, Ivy. Um, hi, I was curious about the maps from the beginning with the women, um, black and white women, and you were sort of saying that they looked, they were similar, but they looked so different. Like white women in the South were sort of had a lot of downward mobility, yeah. and so I was curious what that might be about. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So there are actually, you know, many parts of the U.S. where you actually see poorer outcomes, lower levels of upward mobility for white women than black women starting out at the same income level. And so, you know, it's a little bit tricky to piece apart what is labor force participation choices as opposed to opportunities, right? So it may be that someone gets married and decides that they don't want to work as much, and then that's going to show up as lower levels of own earnings in the tax data. So the reason I don't read too much into that is if you look at a measure like education, educational outcomes, like let's say, did you attend college or did you graduate from college? Those measures actually look very similar for black and white women across the income distribution and both, and, and across areas as well. Um, so, so I think that's part of what's going on there. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, name's Nicola. Uh, I'm a fourth year undergraduate student. Uh, I'm pretty sure a, he's not. <laughs> but go on. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so uh, as a scholarship student here at this great institution, I particularly feel that your research hits deep. And as someone that went through the gifted program, uh, friending bias seems to be pretty big. So obviously, uh, Professor Chetty, that your like, research has lots of public policy implications, but I'm sure many of the folks here are also concerned about the uh, individual, uh, like con individual concerns with regards to your research. So given the totality of your understanding of economic mobility, how can I improve opportunity for my own kid? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question and a great question. Um, I mean, what your question highlights, I think, is what a given person, a given family might want to do might be different from the types of things we want to think about at a social or policy level, and that comes back to issues of equilibrium and scalability. So we were actually having a conversation with uh, your colleagues over lunch where I think for a given family, the simplest thing one can do is try to get into the institutions or groups, if you will, that seem to be currently providing pathways to upward mobility. The schools, the neighborhoods, the colleges, there's a whole track typically in the US and you can see in these kinds of data and to some extent intuit what those places are. Now, that of course is not advice that you can give at a general level, at a policy level, because not everyone can attend Northwestern, not everyone can uh, you know, live in, the, in a particular school district, et cetera. And so I think the big challenge becomes how do you scale that kind of advice? In particular, how do you improve a given place in terms of economic opportunity, be it through changes in you know, schools that lots of folks here have done work on from higher expenditures, smaller class sizes, changes in the quality of teachers, to job training programs, et cetera. So I think it depends a bit upon what um, level of aggregation we're thinking about. And just, uh, so. oh, um, I'll go to a couple more questions. I just wanted to make note that uh, the speaker certainly misspoke. Uh, we know that undergraduates aren't here in this room, uh, according to Kellogg rules, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Christine. Christine Bercheski, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm a faculty member in sociology and a demographer. Thank you so much for this really great talk. Um, I, I was curious to hear more of your thoughts on how this overlapped with what we know about health disparities and longevity and health infrastructure um, and how you think that plays a role and yes. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much so for, for raising that. So you know as economists of course we tend to gravitate first to income as the, as the maybe the simplest outcome to measure but we're well aware that there are many things that matter beyond uh, income. And uh, you know your colleague Hannes, uh, sitting right uh, beside you, of course, has done great work on unrelated issues. So you know the, what we g generally see to summarize in broad brush strokes is we can look in similar data at life expectancy, for example, as a coarse measure of health, and we tend to see a very tight connection between life expectancy and income. And perhaps as a result, we tend to see that the places that are promoting upward mobility in terms of income tend to also be places where you achieve higher levels of life expectancy. And there's other work you know, in a more of an experimental context, for example, in the context of the Moving to Opportunity Experiment. Um, one of my collaborators, Stephanie DeLuca, has a separate paper in JAMA showing that the kind of pattern I was showing you where young kids have bigger economic gains than older kids when they move, uh, you see the same thing with health outcomes, that kids who move to a better neighborhood as part of MTO when they were young have much lower rates of hospitalization as adults and so forth. So my sense is, it's not identical obviously, but a lot of these factors that I've been talking about here in the context of economic mobility also matter similarly for health outcomes, very related to the social determinants of health kind of view that we need to look beyond literally what's happening in the health system itself and think more broadly about these how these influences matter for health. I would just add that we like to think of your colleagues, Stephanie DeLuca, as Northwestern graduates. Oh, yes. Like Excellent. Uh, in the back. Uh, hi, Professor Chetty. Um, I was quite interested with the gear up graph that you had presented a couple slides ago that clearly showed an improvement for those who were in that sort of uh, post or uh, work training program. Uh, the most 
the question I kind of have to follow up with that is, does the program sort of pay for itself, or mm. is the, it too expensive a program to really implement at any sort of scale because it costs way more than the benefits it accrues? Yeah, uh, great question, actually. If I can just jump back to that slide for a second to talk about that. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, this, this is a slide you're talking about, and you, you, know, you see very significant treatment effects, but as I think you, you probably know, this is a very expensive program to, to implement. And so, it, you know, if that green curve went out long enough and those gains were sustained for a very long period of time, my sense is you'd get a pretty high rate of return, or as my colleague Nathan Hendren puts it, very high marginal value of public funds for uh, these kinds of investments. Whether the program would literally pay for itself or not, I don't know. Um, but, you know, what your question gets at a little bit more broadly is how we can m scale these programs in a cost-effective way going forward. And one thing that I had skipped to, that I think is very relevant there is traditionally the way we've assessed that is by running experiments like this, which I think obviously have a tremendous amount of value. But what's difficult when you think about scaling, particularly with these kinds of interventions, which are not like giving someone a pill, like you might wonder about the efficacy when you scale, it depends upon the quality of the mentoring and the types of connections you're forming and so forth that need not scale uniformly. You know, you wonder whether when you're doing this at scale, both will the cost change and will the impacts change. And so one thing I wanted to point out is, traditionally we rely on experiments to, to try to evaluate these questions, but that's very difficult to do going forward systematically. Every time we run the Europe program in a new site, maybe at a lower cost, it's gonna be hard to run an experiment every single time, right? But one thing we found, which I think is super useful in this context, is if you use observational data, so we do a matching approach where we find for each person someone else who did not participate in the Europe program from the same census block, same parental income, same racial background, match on a variety of characteristics that you can do in these very large scale data sets. That's shown by the black line here. You can see that that matching estimator actually works extremely well in terms of getting you exactly the same result as what you see from the experiment, right? Which those of you, you know, in the economics literature would know if you go back actually to, to work done here in Chicago by Bob Lalonde at the University of Chicago, there's an old literature that challenged these kinds of observational approaches that said, you know, we really need to rely on experiments because these kinds of methods don't work. But of course, there's no theorem that they won't work. It partly depends upon the quality of the data you have to find those matches. And our sense increasingly is that this kind of technique can actually be valuable. It's a bit of a methodological aside, but to, I think really get at your question going forward, this type of methodology I think can be quite valuable in coming up with a version of the Europe program that is cost effective and scalable. Sure. There we go. Um, yeah, I actually heard you speak almost six years ago, so it's really cool to see the new additions. Um, and I wanted to ask about economic connectedness. So we actually just learned in one of my classes about stronger versus weaker links in our network. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering with, you know, matches on Facebook, I think that can really vary in terms yeah. of how close you are with people. Was that a consideration in terms of maybe stronger connections um, have a higher impact based off of yeah. income? Yeah, great question. So, you know, the, those ideas of strong versus weak ties go back to people like Mark Granovetter at Stanford who argued that weak ties might be very important in getting people job referrals, for example. And so in the Facebook data, you can classify friends based on how strong the friendships are. You can look at how often people are exchanging messages, appearing together in photos, you know, things like that. You have various ways of judging uh, how close a friendship is. And so it turns out if you replicate all of the analysis I showed you just with your five closest friends, as opposed to all your friends, you get very similar patterns. So that might be surprising. What I think is going on is I think consistent with your intuition, it's certainly plausible that it's your closest friends who are most influential in determining your outcomes. But what turns out to be the case in the data is that if I tell you the socioeconomic status of your five or 10 closest friends, it's incredibly highly correlated with the socioeconomic status of your friends more broadly. So there's a really, you know, people tend to make friends in certain ways and that seems somewhat common between your closest friends and further away friends. And so that actually makes it challenging to tease apart, is it the closest friends who matter the most or the, you know, the more distant friends because those things are so similar to each other. But certainly I think an interesting question to investigate uh, further going forward. 
Sure. Um, uh, down here. Go. We'll hit you back. Yeah. How about first in the orange and then? In the Sorry orange. about that. Um, <clears throat> speaking of, of moving to opportunity kind of projects, do we have any idea what happens to those who don't move when large swaths yeah. of their community leaves? How much of the effects are offset by disinvestment? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the way I think about the, like the Seattle experiment we did or you know, other moving to opportunity type policies is not so much that you're taking a set of people who are happily living in a given neighborhood and kind of plucking them out and asking them to move somewhere else. Most of these folks would have moved anyway. So low income populations tend to be very transitory. One in five low income families moves in a given year. And in particular, the people who've come in to apply for a housing voucher, they are moving for some other reason. So 15% of the population in the Seattle experiment was homeless to begin with. Many folks, you know, they may have gotten evicted. They had some other change that forced them to move. And so the way I think you want to think about those policies is redirecting the flow rather than taking the stock of people living in a given place. And so the reason that matters is, you know, the destabilization effect is likely to be smaller if those people are going to move anyway. But more broadly, you know, I think you're, what, what your question gets at is one needs to worry about the communities that currently have low levels of economic mobility. And obviously, you can't just focus on moving to opportunity. Lots of people are going to be living in those places. And that's why I think it's so important to think about how you invest in those places, in the schools or in other things, to improve economic opportunity there. I don't think we know yet exactly what types of place-based investments are most effective. We're actually doing quite a bit of work on that in our team at present, studying things like the HOPE 6 demolitions and revitalizations and their long-term impacts. At a broad level, my sense is that policies that create this kind of social connection across class lines are things that I at least want to prioritize in terms of studying more carefully. My sense is those kinds of policies uh, are likely to have promise in, in increasing mobility. Okay, I think last audience question from the man in black. Hi, so uh, I'm interested in the behind the scenes kind of. So these policy uh, outcomes are obviously relevant in many in many places except the U.S. Um, from from your experience, what's the what's the best way to convince policymakers first to gather this data? And then after, I guess the more challenging part is to actually act upon the findings. Yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, question. Again, let me just jump up here and just pop up another slide that I think might be relevant. You, you mentioned other places. I just want to point out, you know, I focused on the U.S. And in our team, we focus on the U.S. just because, you know, there's only, only so much one can do. But I've, uh, there are a number of other uh, researchers and former students and so forth who have done starting to do very similar work in other countries, some of which is really, I think, incredibly inspiring and impressive, especially in places with uh, much greater data limitations, you know, African countries, India, and so forth. Uh, and so, you know, I think a very valuable first step, as I hope I've uh, illustrated in this lecture, and I think the work of a lot of folks here has a similar spirit, is just to show very clearly in transparent terms what the issues are in the data, you know, where are the disparities most severe, what kinds of problems are we, are we trying to address. And then I think one of the benefits of big data that I had not quite appreciated when we started to work with these kinds of data is that they make it feasible to communicate in a much more transparent way, right? So one way to think about what statistics uh, is doing, and I hope I don't offend anyone here, but my sense of you know, what statistics is, is basically a way to solve various missing data problems. That's one way to actually conceptualize what a statistical estimator is doing, filling in holes in your data in some sense. And when you have data of the scale, you obviously just have fewer missing data issues. And so it can be very easy to show policymakers just by showing essentially carefully constructed conditional means, you know, here are the policies that seem to work, here are the key disparities you need to address. And what I was hoping to illustrate is that even in a, an era where people have very strong political ideologies, I think that kind of evidence, the type of evidence you know, being compiled by scholars here uh, can really have a transformative impact. And I think we're at a period in our field where the increased availability of these sorts of data can help us build better models, do this kind of transparent analysis, and have an impact on policy in really measurable ways. I hate to end this, but it's time for us to stop. Let's thank Raj Chatty one more time.
there's a reception uh, out, out that way. Thanks, Raj.